I'm Florian from Imperial College London. We all know that we are going to live longer in the future, so, um, but life expectancy is only the average of a population. If I say we will all be 80 years, that's not true, because everyone will have an individual lifespan. But would you like to know how long you're going to live? Or would you like to know how long you're going to live? So with diseases, you can already do that. You could go to your doctor, get a blood test, and determine your individual risk for a certain disease. Like you measure the blood sugar and get the risk for diabetes. Or your cholesterol level can indicate how likely you are for, you are for cardiovascular diseases. But is there actually something in the blood or generally like a chemical compound which would tell us something about your age or your life expectancy? <coughs> um, and this is what I'm trying to answer during my um, PhD. So here you have a survival curve, the black function. Uh, this is the time you live and this is like the percentage alive. So we will all die eventually. This is someone <laughs> with the average lifespan. This is someone who lives a bit shorter and this is someone who's long lived, for example, I don't know, 80, 100 years or 60 years. So um, basically the speed of aging is a very complex mixture between your genes, that's what you have, you can't really change that, and the environment. So the amount or the type of diet you consume, your stress levels or um, pollution or other factors. Mm -hmm. And they make this integrated um, mixture which determines how long you're going to live. So this is essentially a map of our body. It looks very, very complex, but don't worry, I have to deal with this on my average day, not you. But what I'm trying to do, in this mess, I'm trying to find the one chemical compound that will actually give us the link, the prediction between how long we're going to live. And yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. <laughs> But how do we do this, right? It's like, a, it's a mess. So you could either use humans, but the problem is that's expensive, difficult, and for example, I would have to feed you all the same food uh, for the next 80 years, and I don't think anyone would like that. You could use mice. They live three years. If I say, I make them live twice as long, six years, well, AXA only funds me for three years, so that's not an option either. <laughs> but I have very, very tiny worms. You can only see them with a microscope. Tiny, very, very simple organisms. And what I can do, I can make them live from two weeks to four weeks, or even longer, even up to half a year. So how do I do this exactly? I can do this by changing, by manipulating the environment, feeding them different food, or supplementing some nutritional supplements. Or I can, easy with these simple worms, switch genes on and off. There are a certain number of genes, if we know if we switch them off or activate them, then these worms will live longer. And this is what I do. And then I see how long are these individual worms living to get such a curve and see, ah, there are some which live longer, some live shorter, and some live normally. Then I take them and do something like a very, very complex type of blood test, right, to measure all the chemicals inside them. So I'm trying to get each of these chemicals which are on the side for them. And then you can feed it into big computers and generate models, which then will tell you which chemicals are actually linked to lifespan here. We've already done some preliminary experiments, and we found some chemicals which are higher in some of the long-lived worms, which is really exciting. And then we had this idea, what about feeding them to other worms so they are just higher in these worms? And indeed, normal worms that you feed these compounds, they will also live longer. You could say, so what? These are worms. I'm, I'm more complex than a worm. Yeah, that's obviously right. But I'm trying to look at mechanisms and pathways which have been around for millions of years, which are the same between simple bacteria up to humans. So really, there is a fair chance that they are the same and will work the same way. And very interestingly, there was a group uh, recently who has published that the very same compounds uh, also increase their lifespan in mice. So this is really, really exciting. And now we're obviously trying to really understand how that works before we go to the human. But more interestingly, these supplements are already there for nut as nutritional supplements, but we still obviously need to find the right dose where the aging effect kicks in. So this is what 
um, will be done in the future. But maybe in a few years, we will have something like an aging cream that actually works. And that will make us help us make live longer and longer healthy. Thank you. The, um, the worms you use, you, I suppose, confine individually in, um, or are they social? Is there a difference between when they are alone or when there are a lot of them? That's this type of thing? That's, that's interesting. Or for mice? I mean, they're, 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 very, they're very simple. I mean, there's just thousand cells that they're very, very simple. I'm not sure if they even are aware of each other. They might do when they mate, but, uh, that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> but what, for example, what we even do now, we just also look at the, the, the population mean. I just meet many of these worms. But during my PhD, I'm really refining methods to look at the chemicals inside individual worms. I can take a picture of a worm, but instead of colors, I can actually see where are which chemicals located. So this is quite exciting to really, really understand it. And that's also part of my PhD, to push the boundaries there. I'm sorry, I, I know you cannot tell, tell the chemical and that's completely okay, but can you tell them uh, mechanistically how is it uh, involved in which, uh, in which pathway or something like this? Uh? Sure, um, so basically what we, we don't really know yet, but um, what we think it works over the mitochondria, which are the powerhouses in our cell, and we think it makes them more efficient, so they'll give you more sustainable power for a longer time. Um, th that's what, what we think, but, um, and there are, good there are very, very good clues for that, but I, I can't say for sure. But that would be great because the mitochondria haven't changed in millions of years. We have the same as the bacteria pretty much, yeah. You, you were saying that you change, uh, you give them different kinds of food to see what impact it has on the chemicals. Can you play on the stress? Of yeah, the of course you can play on the stress. So that actually we also even have published on that by um, Gofro even like mentioned it. Uh, uh, like gladly uh, on, the, on the Twitter feed. So basically what happens, we can add chemicals which make stress. So there are different types of stress. We, for example, use chemicals to stress them. You can stress them by turning up the heat <coughs> for a longer time. You can change the oxygen levels or expose them to light. So different types of stress. But we obviously try to use different types of stress to make, to make it more conclusive and not just see um, are they stressed by light or, or these things. But yeah, that's how we do it. So what is your final say whether these chemicals are cause or consequence? So that's the, the funny thing. There were first an observation that they're higher and then um, they seem to be a consequence. It doesn't, seem, doesn't only seem to be a correlation which is what you normally get from a prediction. It seems to be really accusation because otherwise, if you feed them, you wouldn't, they wouldn't live longer, right? So there must be like a mechanistic link in, in some way that we're trying to understand. <laughs>